Hello everyone, I'm Dhruva Jyoti Narayan, Associate in Mobility Vertical at BIS Research. It is my honor to present to you today's webinar, Big Data in the Future of Mobility, Opportunities and Challenges. BIS Research has been tracking the automotive market since the past five years. The immense potential of the future of mobility has been reiterated by the large number of registrations we received from numerous professionals and students from organizations across the automotive supply chain. BIS believes that the future of mobility is intertwined, interconnected, and highly synergetic. The key catalysts driving the growth of mobility are referred to as CASE, an acronym for Connected, Autonomous, Shared, and Electric. In this webinar, we will focus upon connected vehicles. For today's discussion, we have an esteemed list of speakers. Our first guest speaker is Todd Brockdorf. Todd is the head of America's solution architecture at Autonomo, one of the leading automotive data service companies. He led solutions engineering in the United States for communications, system integrators, and energy and utility segment for the IBM Watson and Cloud platform. He previously ran his own consulting company, advising clients on strategic infrastructure planning. He started his career at Sprint in solutions engineering for wireline, wireless, and IoT solutions. Our second guest speaker is Amir Irnif. Amir is the Vice President of Marketing at Karamba Security. Amir is responsible for driving the company with his extensive experience in international product and marketing leadership. During his past 10 years at HPE, he led the cybersecurity products and core offerings on a global scale. He has developed an effective product to market value chain and led multiple successful product introductions and portfolio extensions. I thank both the panelists for their gracious presence. Welcome to both of you. In the next 30 minutes, we are all keen to learn from your experience about data generation and data protection in a connected vehicle. And towards the end of the discussion, I will open the panel to the audience for any questions. I would request everyone in the audience to kindly mute your phones during the webinar. The questions should be typed in the Q&A box. They can be typed anytime and will be answered towards the end of the discussion. Any questions that we are not able to answer today shall be reverted to offline. The first agenda for today's webinar is to obtain an overview about connected vehicles while understanding their market potential now and in the coming years. Then we will have a complete evaluation of data services, which will be elaborated by Todd. Next, we will discuss the importance of cybersecurity in connected vehicles, which will be discussed by Amir. Finally, we will have the webinar's conclusion and a quick Q&A session. How will the technology evolve to make connected vehicles a reality? Connectivity and telematics have played an important role in enabling connected vehicles. Currently, infotainment and ancillary services are prominent in the ecosystem. Offerings by OEMs such as Hyundai Blue Link, GM OnStar, Nissan Connect, and BMW iDrive have helped in improving the driving experience. As the number of sensors in future connected and autonomous vehicles increase, a huge amount of data will be generated from these vehicles. Data from these sensors combined with the data from infotainment and ancillary services can be utilized for various purposes and be used to create many new business opportunities, as we will discuss later in our webinar. With increasing amount of data being generated, the opportunity lies in enabling meaningful usage while ensuring cybersecurity. BIS identifies these four main technology clusters, namely connectivity and telematics, infotainment, data services, 
and cybersecurity that need to converge to enable a truly connected vehicle. There are various types of connectivity which entails com communication being established between a vehicle to a range of entities using different types of communication technologies. Currently, a majority of vehicles present today have an initial level of connectivity. These include vehicle to device or vehicle to cloud connectivity. Initial levels of connectivity help in offering better driving experience by making the interaction between the car and its driver simpler by connecting the vehicles with portable devices and the cloud. Keyless cars and real-time navigation are some of the use cases of initial levels of connectivity. As technology advances, BIS believes different types of advanced connectivity will be established in vehicles. In the future, vehicles will have various other types of connectivity such as vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to pedestrian, vehicle to network, vehicle to grid, and vehicle to home, among others. All these advanced features of connectivity will help in enabling the impending transformation in the mobility industry. The minimum threshold for connected vehicles is the ability to connect with a device using Bluetooth or Wi-Fi connectivity. BIS foresees the growth of connected vehicles in the coming years, reaching 95% penetration by 2030, which will mean approximately 141.3 million vehicles that will be connected. What will it take to achieve the desired level of connected vehicle adoption? The major roadblocks upon which there needs to be development to increase the growth of connected vehicles are data services and cyber security. Firstly, we start our discussion with data services and further in this webinar, we will talk more about cyber security. The accessibility of sensors and camera modules is making the car industry increasingly data driven. When combined with state of the art software and advanced computing, data transforms into decisions inside autonomous cars. As autonomous vehicle technologies continue to evolve, the data generated inside cars only continues to grow exponentially. There are various sources for data generation in a connected vehicle, such as sensors, infotainment systems, navigation systems, and ECUs, among others. The estimated amount of data being generated in a connected vehicle will range from approximately 1.4 terabytes per hour to up to 19 terabytes per hour. To make this immense amount of data significant, the role of data service companies will be crucial. A significant contributor to the growth of automotive data services has been Autonomo, where they are continuously working on extracting value for connected car data and providing it to various stakeholders. To discuss this further, I would like to invite thoughts from our first guest speaker, Todd Brockdorf. Over to you, Todd. Thank you so much. Each day I speak with OEMs, telematic service providers, fleet providers, trying to understand what they see in the uses for connected vehicle technology. And really it comes down to three main areas. They're looking for connected vehicle data to bring value to their drivers, bring value to their dealership networks, and finally bring value to their company. As you mentioned, there's a plethora of data out there, and this is where Autonomo comes in. Next slide, please. The Autonomo data services platform was built from the ground up to handle exactly this, car data. But it's much more than a data exchange. It aggregates and reshapes data from multiple sources to make it immediately useful to a diverse set of service providers. Whether we're cleansing the data or anonymizing it, uh, aggregating and enriching it to work better for specific use cases, or managing driver consent. The platform makes the data worth more to service providers, so it delivers revenue and opportunities for OEMs 
and for fleet providers. The platform also addresses core needs such as regulatory compliance, accounting, billing, security, market management, and more. Next slide, please. Specifically talking about big data, there are four main elements to a platform when you're looking at ingesting uh, connected vehicle data. There, the first is ingestion. Now there are uh, three main types of ways to take connected vehicle data um, from an OEM or fleet providers data lake, either through streaming services, a REST API, or object storage, such as Amazon's S3 or Azure um, blob storage. Once the data is ingested into a platform, uh, processing takes over, like server serverless functions, um, data cleansing, and data normalization. This is where you take data because it's not always 100% accurate. For example, you'll see data points that are in the middle of the Pacific Ocean when clearly a vehicle is not traveling there. So this is where the data cleansing comes in. In data normalization, you when you look at vehicle data, it comes in as a bunch of different parameters. So for example, when you're talking fuel level, are you talking in gallons or liters? Are you talking in percentage of full or percentage of empty? And so the autonomous data platform uh, normalizes these parameters once it's ingested into the platform. After the processing of the data, uh, analytics, enrichment, and storage happen. So we run Spark um, within the data environment to be able to do some light analytics on the data that's coming in and also aggregate the data between various data sources. Also, we use uh, data enrichment techniques such as anonymization or consent management or also um, adding geolocation data to GPS functions. And then finally, we divide the data into two sections, one for caching or quick access to vehicle data, and then also into object storage for longer term storage. And finally, at the output of the autonomous data platform is the usability. Because after all, we need to be able to make data easily accessible and usable to folks who are designing new apps and services around all of this connected data. And in that form, you see things like uh, API reporting. So reports that are based on API, uh, calling APIs. You also have event-based pushes. So if there's an accident out on a freeway, um, that's a real-time event push that some people are interested in. And then finally, data quality reports being able to report to the service providers on the quality of their data and being able to help them make their data more useful to these service providers and app designers. Next slide, please. So as you saw earlier, there are some, there, there are a bunch of data parameters that you can collect off of a connected vehicle. Uh, over 200 or so are uh, useful in this space. And they break up into categories such as mobility, behavioral, diagnostic, and safety. From a mobility standpoint, things like odometer or engine status or heading or speed, that's kind of your classic uh, connected vehicle technologies. But as we get into more in-depth data sources that can be obtained from a vehicle, things like media uh, infotainment data, uh, blinker status, wheel position, horn status, uh, temperature, you know, then you begin to have uh, more interesting use cases that you can do with connected vehicle data. Of course, there's also diagnostic data such as engine temperature, RPM or tire pressure, oil level, things that you can use for predictive maintenance or for um, better positioning within the tier one, tier two automotive space uh, to help them make better parts to offer long-term um, viability of their vehicles. And then finally, safety status, things like airbag status, um, door status, uh, hard braking, harsh acceleration, things like that that can affect not only uh, an immediate 
use case, uh, such as deploying emergency services, but also future planning like road safety and, and being able to um, offer a better driving experience through cities and, um, and municipalities. Next slide, please. And we see all of these data parameters broken up into two main use cases, personal data and aggregate data. And when I, see per, when I say personal data, it's not along the lines of you as a person being able to identify you, but more specifically for your particular vehicle. Aggregate data is where we take connected vehicle data and aggregate it from a bunch of different sources. It's anonymous bulk data. Next slide, please. You can see some examples of use cases in the personal arena. Things like usage-based insurance. I wanna know how you drive uh, as opposed to uh, how your neighbor drives or emergency services. If you get in an accident, you wanna make sure that they dispatch a, a emergency services right to your location, not somebody else's uh, location. Or in-vehicle delivery, um, such as I want the package delivered to my trunk, not your neighbor's trunk. So these are more personal use cases. Again, I don't necessarily need to know who you specifically are, but I need to be able to identify your vehicle in order to be able to offer uh, services designed for that vehicle. Next slide, please. The aggregate data use cases are things like media research. Again, I don't necessarily need to know who you are, but I need to know the general area of what you're listening to or where you are so that I can understand listening habits within a given market or smart city services, uh, things that um, being able to offer green wave, green wave services or better movement through cities um, using aggregate data. Parking apps, and the, uh, I don't, again, I don't need to know who you are, but I need to know that there's an available parking spot on this street, or hyper-local weather, weather services, being able to um, use elements of the vehicle, such as windshield wipers or uh, temperature, outside temperature, to be able to predict hyper-local weather. And then, of course, the classic uh, traffic and mapping with um, uh, uh, aggregate use cases. Next slide, please. Autonomo has created what we see as the autograph. And this is where we match the market maturity per use case against the value potential per vehicle. And if you wanna look at the connected vehicle landscape and understand what the maturity is versus the value potential per vehicle, there are some things that are much more established such as usage-based insurance uh, or navigation mapping compared to newer elements of connected vehicle data, such as EV management or weather or parking. And what the autograph does is it explains in a picture the value per vehicle against the market maturity. So for example, with usage-based insurance, it's more personal, there's a higher value potential per vehicle. Likewise, though, with navigation mapping, because it's aggregated bulk data, you can see that, um, that, that even though it's a mature use case, it's not as valuable per vehicle. However, that's not to say that with an aggregate of bulk data, you can't make up for the difference between individualized uh, personalized services per vehicle when we're talking about value um, for connected vehicle data. Likewise, with the autograph, we see that the use cases, as the market matures, you'll see more of these use cases shift to the right. A lot of this is new. These are new connected vehicles. These are new connected vehicle use cases. And so the market is moving to the right, but it's a mat um, maturation process going forward. Next slide, please. And I just want to end with a quick autonomous overview by the numbers. You know, we're engaged with about 15 different OEMs today. We have about 18 million vehicles on the platform, tracking over uh, 
311 billion kilometers per year with an ecosystem of about 85 partners. We're a worldwide company with about 70 employees and, and uh, growing. So overall, um, Autonomo is not only a data marketplace, a connected vehicle platform, but also we're enabling services for connected vehicle drivers, passengers, and municipalities. I'll be happy to take your questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Todd, for highlighting on how business across the supply chain can leverage big data in the connected vehicle ecosystem. Now, let us look and shift our focus towards automotive cybersecurity. A connected vehicle has numerous attack points which can hamper the vehicle's functioning. Connectivity in a software-defined car for the future is the key. Therefore, securing it from threats is also something companies must prioritize. There are various types of cyber attacks on a car that can cause harm to the vehicle and to the driver, such as injuries, deaths, or damage to infrastructure. Vehicle OEMs have often recalled their cars to avoid cybersecurity attacks. A significant contributor to the growth of automotive cybersecurity has been Caramba Security, where they are continuously working on providing cybersecurity solutions to automotive OEMs. To discuss this further, I would like to invite thoughts from our second guest speaker, Amir Enif. Over to you, Amir. Thanks, Rupa. Um, hi, everybody. So it was very interesting to hear Autonomous' uh, description of how big data is the new currency and there's so much to be done in the, the new car, in the connected car. And I happen to have a vis visibility on that from a cybersecurity perspective. Because in reality, when there is data, there is value, bad actors will also come to show off their face or their capabilities at least. Um, next slide. What makes the, you know, the motor vehicle interesting for hackers is that there is a lot of code. So there is connectivity as a must, and, and Rupa was describing the different types of connectivity that are coming up. But as you can see, already the modern car has 100 million lines of code. And statistically, within 100 million lines of code, you have about 60,000 um, bugs that just the coders inserted in, and maybe 5,000 of them can be used as vulnerabilities for the hackers to manipulate the car behavior. So this was really what opens the, the door when you look at a product that complex and that sophisticated, there is enough areas where the hackers will find their needs. And if the next slide will show you, next, this is already happening, right? Famous attacks of the last few years. The most famous, of course, is 2015, where uh, two hackers were able to, uh, two, two white hat hackers were able to take the Jeep Cherokee and put it into the ditch and really drove uh, FCA to recall 1.4 million vehicles. It's a major impact on the industry, really opened up the eyes of the whole industry to the impact of cybersecurity. But even just recently, there were two interesting hacks where a GPS tracking application was breached and the hacker was able to show how much he can monitor and what he can uh, kill the engine on the fly because that's the sort of the behavior of this application. And he basically used that to make money. And at the same time, almost, there was a famous Chicago heist of a car to go um, application and kept taking control over those cars and hiding them. So really hackers are starting to pay attention into the car. The next slide actually look at an analysis and more structured. Sorry, the next slide is actually looking at what does it mean? If you're looking at, uh, we just did a survey last month uh, with the consumers in Germany, a very important automotive market, right? And there's two questions here in this slide. How worried are you that the connected car is gonna be getting cyber attack? That's on the left for extremely concerned or moderately concerned on the top. To the other perspective, you know, the positive aspects of what's happening to the modern vehicle, which is autonomous vehicle. It's coming, it will be the future of driving. The consumers were supposed to say strongly agree or somewhat agree. And the scary thing for the industry, if you think about it, is this 38% that are the future of autonomous vehicle. That's what they're expecting. That's what they're assuming will be the future of driving. And at the same time, they are extremely concerned or moderately concerned with cyber attacks. 
So 38% of the, of the potential of this business is under risk. And that's the future. If you're looking back, and this is the next slide, please. If you're looking back three years, you see, and this is also drives us to talk about how does the industry react to the challenge, right? In the last three years, there were multiple uh, hacks by uh, white hat hackers that showed the industry what they can do. Now, the recent attacks we just saw, they were on the mobile application. But the most sophisticated attacks, the one that actually can change direction and speed, so basically taking control over the car, all of them basically took control of some um, uh, ECU in the car, a component in the car, the infotainment system, the telematic system, maybe the gateway in the case of the last uh, BMW uh, uh, analysis done by the Keen Labs team. Um, each one of those attacks were able to control the car. And so the, the automotive industry is reacting to this. By definition, they cannot be sitting aside and ignoring this uh, reality. Next slide. What they, do, they start doing as, a, as, a, as, a, as an organization, you know, responsible organization, the car manufacturers start putting together requirements, start enforcing uh, secure code, a static code analysis and secure code uh, development practices and include pen testing in the end of the process when the ECU is leaving the, going towards to integration into the, into the car. So there is a, a life cycle. The next slide, you see they also start adding more and more technologies. And I think this is all very positive. The industry is res showing responsibility, moving to address the threat. We know this industry, you know, is considered to be heavy and significant. But in reality, there are, there are significant changes already in the, mo in the mix in current cars in order to protect the safety of the users and the data that they are now collecting as part of what we saw in the beginning of this webinar. Now, as you see, there's multiple different technologies introduced, and I just want to, uh, to point out uh, that, that the introduction of the technologies are coming one after another as they are seeing the, the threat. So for instance, ECU protection, where Caramba is focusing, is now uh, on the, in the requirements of many of the manufacturers, and therefore the tier ones that are looking to assemble those ECUs together. And this is a positive sign that the, uh, the attacks that we saw three years ago would have been prevented. I'd like to complete with uh, two words about what uh, Caramba is doing in the ECU protection in my next slide. So we took an approach of let's build this security built in into the ECU. These are manufacturing organizations. The automotive industry is a manufacturing uh, industry. Actually one of the biggest, if not the biggest. I just saw uh, some statistics in Germany Automotive industry is responsible for 6.9% of the GDP. So it's a significant industry in the countries where the manufacturing is done. And so our approach was to build in the hardening of, this, of the security elements inside the ECUs. So our first step is we're sealing them. Then we actually do a runtime validation to make sure that there is no attack. And if there is an attack, we can prevent it. And what we see more and more is that also there is an element of, and this is related to what Autonomy was describing as a, a vehicle cloud, not just data for um, operations and business and maintenance, but there also there is requests for data of cybersecurity. So is there an attack? Is there an attempt of attack? Where is this attack going in the car? Where is this attack going in the code? So we can fix these issues and over there update them. Next slide. The key for anything we do in automotive, and I think for any player in this uh, industry, is really, and, and we've been doing this now, we have a, pr a proven track record of three years with 17 OEMs and tier ones, with multiple projects, around 32 different projects, is to provide the security, but also not to hinder the performance of those ECUs. This is a very well-crafted uh, equipment that is putting into the car and do the whole thing in an automatic way so there is not change in the way that the manufacturer is developing software and the way that the software is being delivered to the final assembly line. And uh, I want to close with one last slide related to um, ThreatHive, which is a service we announced last year and the end of last year. What we did is we, we realized that as part of this development process of a secure development process, those ECUs are um, only being tested in the last 
cycle of the development life cycle, which is many times it's too late. So we developed an, um, a system where we are using, um, basically uh, we're taking those ECUs before they are reaching uh, production and taking them out into the, into the wild, if you wish, let the attackers ha uh, hack them. We see what they can do, what they cannot do, and basically expose more and more vulnerabilities so we can bring them back into the uh, development cycle before the production of the ECU. So this Threat Hive platform is now live, provide us a very interesting view of what attackers can do with the real ECUs in the market. That's it for me. So thank you, Amir and Todd, for discussing automotive data protection and data services in connected vehicles so illustratively. After listening to both of you, I can surely say that the threat to connected and autonomous vehicles is imminent and that privacy, monetary impact and safety are the main risks. We have also listened about how big data provides huge opportunities for various stakeholders and that vehicle data reshaping increases value and speed to market for companies. We can infer that the automotive industry is stepping up to the challenge with gradual investment in in-vehicle security and data services and new vehicle security and data service vendors are helping the ecosystem to mature, securing the future of mobility. With that thought, let me conclude today's session. And now I declare the forum open for any questions from the listeners. I request the listeners to kindly type in the questions on the chat box available on the bottom of your screen. And I will be happy to pass the questions to the esteemed speakers we have with us. Taking the first question for uh, taking the first question for Todd, the question is, what do you think is the next frontier for technological development in automotive cybersecurity? Thanks for the question. I think a lot of it has to do with um, uh, separation and, and being able to um, create security layers within the model. Um, for example, the Autonomo cl cloud platform does not actually touch an OEM's vehicle. We interact at the OEM's data lake, for example. And so that is one layer of security. Uh, you can't actually reach a vehicle directly from the Autonomo platform. Then you have an OEM that has their own security controls around their data lake which then has another um, set of security controls before you actually can collect vehicle data or connect into the vehicle itself. So I, I think it's taking, the, the frontier is really around this multi-layered approach to security. And um, just like in physical networks and physical systems, a multi-layered approach is what you've seen develop over the last um, last few years. And, and I think that's where um, automotive security is going and along with the things that Caramba is doing like ECU security and hardening within the vehicle itself. All right. Thank you for the answer, Todd. The next question is for Amir. The question is, do various system suppliers for connected vehicles often have built in security in their components? If not, how can the industry develop consistent cybersecurity requirements? for components suitable for multiple suppliers? So there is no standards in cybersecurity. And if you think about it, it doesn't make sense because the hacker will always, if there is a standard, it has to be published. And it's sort of revealing to the hacker already one layer of defense. So all of the vendors out there and all of the customers, so tier ones and OEMs, are not really revealing what they're doing and what they're planning to do, just not to give ammunition to the other side. The reality is that there is already um, different types of uh, security components inserted into different uh, ECUs, like the telematics units, which is very critical. The telematics is a high uh, sought after um, component that the attackers will always try to achieve because it's uh, by definition connected. Um, software integrity is a key element and it's definitely there. 
managing the access, managing the cloud. Like Todd said, there is an element of cloud to vehicle and how do you manage that interface to be as secure as you can. The, all these layers of, of uh, we call it defense in depth, are implemented in telematics for sure and also in infotainment for sure. And now they are, we start seeing um, cybersecurity moves into the ADAS and into the actual driving components of the car. All right. Thank you for the answer. Uh, taking the next question for Todd, the question is, what is the biggest technical challenge in storing all this data in self-driving cars, especially in real time? When you're looking at connected vehicle data, um, there are two platforms. There's the in-vehicle connected data, and then there's the data that gets offboarded from the vehicle. Now, not all of the vehicle that is, or excuse me, not all of the data that is generated within the vehicle, um, one needs to be stored, or two needs to be offboarded. So. Um, you, you see it today in things like diagnostic trouble codes. There are some things that actually are stored in the vehicle permanently. Um, but likewise, others that are more fleeting, like the gas cap uh, being loose, for example, uh, don't need to be stored long term. So I think that will extend also to components that are generating uh, data within the vehicle. Some will be useful for a point in time. Um, but some won't be useful long-term, and so they'll just be discarded. The industry is going through a balance right now of trying to figure out what that is. Um, what, what's useful now um, in the vehicle, what can be efficiently offboarded from the vehicle, and then what, what's useful for those folks that are designing new apps and services around connected vehicle data. Um, as I'm talking with OEMs today, there, some of the conversations that we're having are surprising. They didn't know that there was a use for this component or that or that piece of data, and so now they're adjusting their platforms to be able to accommodate uh, things that are the app service providers and developers are really looking for. So it's about balancing storage within the vehicle versus um, the cost to offboard it. Okay, thank you for the answer, Todd. The next question we have is for Amir. The question is, there are various commodity components and systems in a vehicle which are prone to cybersecurity attacks as presented in your webinar. What components or systems of the vehicle pose the greatest cybersecurity risk or is more prone to be compromised? Okay, so a little bit uh, along to what I was saying before, it's the matter of the connectivity and the size of code. Right, so that's where if you look into opportunity for the hacker, if there is more code, there is more connectivity. Think of the infotainment system. Now we have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, USB usually, and of course, uh, a cellular interface with the telematics. So the infotainment system, the IVI is very, very connected these days. And also has quite a lot of code. So it's not surprisingly that a lot of the hackers go for the infotainment system first. But telematics is right second after it. And I think, as I said, we start seeing safety critical components where cybersecurity is required as well. And this is more coming from the perspective of what happens if there is an attack. Because if there is an attack on infotainment, maybe you can block it somewhere down the road. But if the attack is managing to go down into the ADAS environment, by definition, we gave the ADAS control over the car. So there is an element of the value of the cybersecurity there, even if it's more difficult to achieve, is more significant for the manufacturer. All right, thank you for the answer. The next question we have is for Todd. The question is, currently the prices of telematics and data services for a vehicle are high. Are consumers willing to pay for connected data services? And do they have any privacy concerns? Yeah, so as far as paying for connected vehicle data services, and I agree that you know the, the cost of offboarding that data uh, is high right now. Um, what you see in the market is that OEMs are starting to give connected services to new drivers. So oftentimes they'll bundle in something like three years of connectivity when you purchase a new vehicle. And that way they're able to obtain data from, from the vehicle. Now that being said, even though um, 
another approach is, is that even after that service has expired or they don't want to have consumers pay directly for that data, um, this is where their monetization efforts come into play because they're trying to recoup the cost of offboarding that data. And, and so even though a driver um, may not be receiving things like um, Wi-Fi in the car, for example, anymore after a connected data service has been terminated or not turned on in the first place. OEMs still have those modems in the vehicle and they're still trying to maximize or at least recoup revenue from the data that's coming uh, through those services. So sometimes the driver themselves is not actually paying for the service. Um, it's, it's the OEM that is trying to recoup the cost of that data. Now, as far as privacy goes, that's <laughs> that's a whole nother webinar, but um, in short, yes, privacy is certainly a concern. Uh, there are various ways to deal with privacy and consent. Um, I'll, I'll just say a short word on privacy in that transparency, uh, what you're doing with the data is, is really the way to go and clear driver consent is needed in the privacy space. Okay. Um, we will take one last question before we conclude. And this question is also for Todd. The question is, could you please outline the revenue model of a company such as yours? Certainly. Autonomo works on a revenue share model with our data providers. So like I was saying, OEMs, telematic service providers, fleet providers are providing data into the Autonomo platform. After we cleanse, normalize, and aggregate that data and make it useful to the service providers, folks that are designing um, new apps and services for connected vehicles, uh, they're the ones that are paying for that data. And then we share a portion of that revenue with the data provider. So we work on a rev share model with our data providers. All right. Thank you for the answer, Todd. We have now run out of time. Thank you so much, Todd and Amir, for such insightful answers. In the end, I would like to thank our speakers for joining us. We have really learned a lot about the future of big data and mobility and what Autonomo and Caramba Security promises to do with this in this regard. We have got an overwhelming response through registrations and questions. With the help of our speakers and analysts at BIS, we will try to answer these questions and send it across via email. We would also put out a blog post within the next few days. With this, uh, I would also like to inform that the white paper webinar PPT and the webinar recording will be also shared within the next two days. With this, I conclude today's webinar. Thank you everyone who attended and I wish you all a wonderful week ahead. Thank you.